very much. It's good to see so many of you here. It's very exciting to be here. This is the first time I've been uh, in India, and uh, thank you very much to the folks at Salt, Salt March for inviting me to join you today. Uh, in the United States, we hear so much talk about how much energy and excitement there is around the IT industry here in India, and it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to see that firsthand. Uh, my name is Jesse James Garrett. Uh, my company is called Adaptive Path. I live in San Francisco, California, which is on the other side of the planet, uh, and it's uh, nighttime there, so forgive me if I'm perhaps not as awake as I could be at this hour. Back in the year 2000, I was working uh, in San Francisco uh, as an information architect uh, in a web design consultancy there. And uh, I was the first information architect they had hired, and uh, the people that I was working with, my, the clients and some of the other designers that I was working with, really didn't understand what it was that I did. And so to explain what I did and how it fit into the larger picture of what we were doing uh, as a firm, I uh, created this document, uh, this diagram called the Elements of User Experience. I'll be talking a lot more about this in the master class later on today. I put this thing up on the web and something really interesting happened. It started popping up all over the place. And in fact, lots of people started printing it out and putting it up on their walls and using this tool that I'd created to explain my job to other people, uh, to explain their jobs to other people as well. And this became so popular that uh, eventually a publisher got in touch with me and asked me to turn it into a book, which is also called The Elements of User Experience and is available uh, at places like Amazon.com. In 2001, I started a company of my own called Adaptive Path. We describe the work that we do as product strategy and experience design. It's kind of fancy consultant speak for uh, figuring out what people want and defining and designing products for them. And we do this work with uh, many of the companies that are considered to be kind of on the leading edge of what's going on on the web today. Companies like Blogger and the Creative Commons and Six Apart and Flickr. But we don't just work with uh, little web startups, we also do this kind of work for great big companies as well, companies like Intel and Microsoft and Nokia. In addition to our consulting work, a few years back we created a product of our own, a product called MeasureMath. MeasureMath is an analytics tool uh, for people who run blogs. Uh, and we actually didn't get very far in the development of MeasureMath before it was uh, snatched up by our good friends at Google and it's now part of their ever-growing empire. Blogs are a big, important thing for us at Adaptive Path. It's been something that we've been doing uh, for a very long time. As a matter of fact, uh, many people actually don't know that that word blog, for better or worse, actually came from one of the people at Adaptive Path. But this might not be the word that you know us best for. That word is probably the word Ajax, which was my coinage back in 2005. So people have asked me, why it is that these, uh, these words, these brand new concepts have, uh, have come out of Adaptive Path. And I think that the reason for it has to do with the nature of the work that we do as designers of technology products and the problem that we are always seeking to solve, which brings us into collision with brand new ideas. And the problem that I see us trying to solve is this one. The problem of how grandma sees the remote control most of the buttons on uh, these ever more complex remote controls that we see these days, uh, she has no idea what they are. She forgot, no clue, never seen this one before. Some of these buttons have more uh, ominous functions, lose sound, lose picture, emit sparks, ominous smell. TV explodes, house blows up, cause nationwide blackout, tidal wave starter, launch rocket ship. People are threatened by technology. It's mysterious. They don't understand it. It confuses them. So what we've seen in web technology over the course of the last couple of years is the emergence of this wave of startups seeking to make technology friendly. And you can see this in the, lo in the logos of these companies, these very round and colorful and friendly logos, trying to make technology approachable for people. Now, a lot of people have looked at the Web 2.0 trend and they say, well, what this is all about is technology. All of these new technologies that have uh, grown up and have matured and have become viable tools for building businesses. 
But I think that focusing on technology is not the right way to think about what's going on with Web 2.0. To really understand what's going on with Web 2.0, we have to take a look a little bit farther back. The year is 1886. And the Scientific American magazine published a cover story hailing a new photographic apparatus. They called this, photograph this new camera the most practical of systems for the itinerant photographer. And here's the diagram of it. But if you look at this diagram, you look at all of the letters on the diagram, and you look at the description of how to operate this most practical of new systems for photography, you can see that this is a very complex thing to use. But about the same time that this article came out, this fellow was working on a different idea about photography. And he summarized his idea like this. You press the button, we do the rest. This is an inventor named George Eastman in the United States, and he had developed a brand new photographic technology. Cameras up to that point had always used plates of glass to take photographs. And he had this idea for a new way to take photographs that involved, instead of plates of grass, glass, a roll of continuous film. And so he went about bringing his new technology to market. But instead of simply creating a camera like that other one, only with a roll of film in place of the plates of glass, he reinvented the camera from the inside out. His new idea for a camera was so radical that he felt like it needed a brand new name. And he called his camera the Kodak. And instead of the 19 steps that we see in, that, in the description of how to operate that other camera, Eastman's camera could be operated simply by one, two, three. You press the button, and the Eastman Kodak Company, the most important company in the history of photography, did the rest. Now we look at the history of photography, and it's really distinctly divided into these two phases before Kodak, when photography was the province of experienced professionals or really very dedicated hobbyists because it was such a complex technology to use. And then after Kodak, when that company transformed this technology into something with a broad consumer appeal. Now the Kodak camera is the kind of project, the kind of product that all of us would love to be a part of, right? We'd love to say that we helped create a product that transformed its entire category. So how do we do that? How do we see to it that the products that we create have that kind of transformative effect? I think the way to, that we start doing that is by asking ourselves this question. What is the highest compliment someone can pay to a product that we've created? What's the best thing we can imagine someone saying about that product. Do we want to hear them say something like this? Highly monetizable. They are clearly going to be able to sell this thing for a lot of money. Do we want to hear them say something like this? Really very sturdy, very reliable. Or do we want to hear them say something like this? I can't live without it. This product has become so much a part of my life I don't know what my life would be if I didn't have this product in it. Isn't that really what we're after? Everyone who designs and develops products. How can we get that reaction from the people who use the things that we create? Let's ask this guy about it. He seems to know something about creating products that people can't live without. Here's Apple CEO Steve Jobs with his company's latest sensation, the iPhone. And here's what he says about what it takes to create great products. He says, when you start looking at a problem, and it seems really simple with all these simple solutions, 
you don't really understand the complexity of the problem. And your solutions are way too oversimplified, and they don't work. What he's describing here is an approach to technology product design and development where we rely on technology itself as the means of delivering value to our users. Now this can often be a successful strategy for a product early on in the history of a product category. Consider this product. This is WordStar. WordStar, once upon a time, was the world's most popular word processing program. Now, if we look at it now, it doesn't look like much, does it? Kind of flat, kind of gray, kind of hard to use. But word processing was a brand new category. And WordStar's competition was this. And compared to this, an electronic word processor really did deliver value. This is the uh, Englishman Samuel Johnson who once described this phenomenon like this. He said, like a dog's walking on his hind legs, it is not done well, but you are surprised to find it done at all. We can imagine a similar reaction to the early video cassette recorders in people's homes. Look at that thing. Not much to look at. It's big, it's bulky, it's probably noisy. Not the easiest thing in the world to use. But then something happened. Let's go back to Steve Jobs and the second part of what he says of what it takes to create products that people can't live without. He says, then you get into the problem and you see it's really complicated. And you come up with all these convoluted solutions. That's sort of the middle. And that's where most people stop. And the solutions tend to work for a while. Here he's describing an approach to technology product design and development where we've moved beyond technology as our means of delivering value to users, and we now deliver value through the features incorporated in our product. The trouble with this as an approach to creating your product is that if you take it to its logical conclusion, you end up with something like that. Here's Microsoft Word with all the toolbars turned on. Now the design of every product sends a message to the users. What's the message that this product sends? The message here is that word processing is really complicated. In fact, it's so complicated that the creators of the product couldn't figure out how to reduce the complication of it. So they decided to make that the user's problem. Here, we're going to give you a bunch of tools. You figure out how to put them together in a way that's going to work for you. Here's a more recent, probably one of the, of the last generation, of high-end video cassette recorders. And in the evolution of the, of the VCR, they acquired all of these features along the way. And yet, the blinking 12 o'clock on the VCR has become this iconic example of a feature intended to deliver value to users that doesn't. So how do we get beyond that? Here's the last part of what Steve Jobs has to say about it. He says, the really great person will keep on going and find the key underlying principle of the problem and come up with a beautiful, elegant solution that works. A beautiful, elegant solution that works. Sounds like the kind of thing Steve Jobs would say, right? Maybe talking about the iPhone or the iPod. But the interesting thing about this quote for me is that the Steve Jobs who said it wasn't this guy it was this guy, all the way back in 1984. So what we're talking about here isn't a technology trend at all. We're talking about a mindset, a way of thinking about product design and development. A beautiful, elegant solution that works. Let's break that down. See what he means by this. By beautiful, he's talking about creating products that are aesthetically appealing to the users. 
when we talk about elegance, we're talking about simplicity of design. When we describe something as a solution, we mean that it's something that actually addresses a genuine need. Not technology for its own sake, but technology that fits into people's lives in a meaningful way. And technology that can actually be used by the people for whom it's intended. Not merely used by the engineers, but be being used by the users. To get there, we have to move beyond thinking of technology or features as the way that we deliver value to users and deliver value to users through the experience that our products create. Even Microsoft has started to pick up on this trend. This is the latest version of Microsoft Word. A beautiful, elegant solution that works. They've simplified the design, they've increased its aesthetic appeal, they've increased its connection to real user needs. Let's go back to the VCR. As I said, the, uh, this is probably one of the last generation of commercial video cassette recorders, in part because of the rise of DVD as a medium, and in part because of the rise of digital video recorders. In the United States, the most popular of these is a brand called TiVo. And TiVo is one of these products that if you ever talk to a TiVo user, they are fanatical about this product. They love, love, love their TiVo, and they insist that everyone should have a TiVo because it'll make everyone's life better. And whatever you do, don't take my TiVo away because I can't live without it. It's a product that's transformed their experience of television. But what is it really? It's a VCR with a hard drive instead of a tape. Now the folks at TiVo, when they, put, when they brought their product to market, they faced exactly the same choice that George Eastman faced back in the 1800s when he brought his Kodak camera to market. They could have looked at that Sony VCR that we were just looking at and said, you know what? Sony sells three million of these VCRs every single year. This is clearly the product that consumers want. So we'll just replace the tape drive technology with hard drive technology, we'll bring that to market, and we'll have a successful product. Now they may well have had a successful product if that had been their strategy, but do you think they would have had a revolutionary product? Would they have had the kind of product that brings about this fanaticism among its users? Another kind of product that stirs a lot of fanaticism is video games. The video game industry is about 30 years old now. And it runs in sort of these five-year cycles. Every five years, we get a new wave of uh, video game consoles for the home. And in each, of, each wave, the companies are always trying to compete with one another on how they've improved the graphics, how they've improved the sound, how they've improved the experience that the product delivers. And because this, this industry has become so intensely competitive, these companies actually now start talking about their products before they even come to market. In the most recent product cycle, the first product to market came from Microsoft. And Microsoft, in advance of bringing their product out, proclaimed the enormous investment they were making in technology. All of the money they were spending on new chips to deliver higher quality graphics and better sound in their product, which was came to market as the Xbox 360. Now Microsoft was the number two player in the market. The number one player was Sony. And after Microsoft made its announcements, Sony, not about to be outdone by Microsoft, said they were going to spend even more money on technology, spend even more money on chips, for better graphics and better sound in their product, the PlayStation 3. Now the number three player in the industry at that time was the Japanese company Nintendo. Their sales were already far lagging Microsoft and Sony. And they announced their product, they said, 
that they were not making an investment in technology. They were not going to try to be a part of that arms race. That their next generation console was going to be built with cheap, off-the-shelf parts, and it was going to come out at a lower price point. Their product, when they announced it, the industry analysts said that this was market suicide. That Nintendo had lost its way, and this was likely to be their last video game console because they couldn't compete with Microsoft and Sony on technology. Nintendo's product at the time was codenamed Revolution. When they brought it to market, it was a product known as the Wii. And it's true, the Wii is built with cheap, off-the-shelf, readily available parts. What we would consider to be last-generation technology. But they've, uh, they've brought those technologies together in a way that delivers a very different kind of experience than the experience that the Xbox and the PlayStation deliver because of the motion-sensitive controller that the Wii uses, translating people's natural motions into control of the system. Nintendo chose not to compete on technology, but to compete on experience. And this has really paid off for them. They were a year late to market. And yet within the first nine months, they had already outsold both Microsoft and Sony, and Nintendo is now back on top. They are now the number one video game console in the world. This has not just turned out to be a good product strategy for Nintendo, it's actually turned out to be a good business strategy as well. Because Microsoft, having made that enormous investment in technology, their console, you buy it on the shelf in the United States for $400. That same console costs Microsoft $525 to manufacture. They lose money with every console that they sell on the theory that they'll make that money back when they sell, sell games. Sony, again, not about to be outdone by Microsoft, their product sells for $600. And it costs them $850 to manufacture. They lose even more money than Microsoft does with every product that they ship. For Nintendo, their product, which costs $250, only costs them $150 to manufacture. So Nintendo, by choosing to compete on, on experience and not competing on technology, has created for themselves a revenue stream that their competitors don't even have. This product has mostly been forgotten. But it was once upon a time thought to be one of those transformative products. This is the Diamond Rio PMP300. This was the first widely available uh, portable MP3 player. And when this product came out, the industry analysts were very excited. I think perhaps one of the themes here is don't listen to the industry analysts. This was going to be that transformative product. It was going to change everything. This brand new technology, MP3, it had all the right features. They were so sure that this product was going to be this transformative product that in the United States, the recording industry went to court to have this product banned from American shores. It was considered to be such a threat to their industry. But the Rio wasn't that transformative product. Three years later, another product came along, many fewer features, cost more money, and completely took over the market. Apple's iPod. Now, iPod is, of course, one of these examples that people like to use about the power of design in uh, creating a successful technology product. But I think people often don't recognize really what's going on with the design of the iPod. The iPod represents a recognition of this powerful psychological factor when people interact with technology products. There's a great deal of scientific evidence that now 
shows that the way that people engage with an interactive technology product is very different from the way that they engage with other kinds of products, other kinds of simple tools. Because an interactive technology product exhibits behavior, literally, the mechanisms in our brains that are engaged when we use that product are different. The mechanisms in our brains that are engaged when we use a technology product are the same ones that are engaged when we interact with other people. We engage with these products as if they were human. There was a, there was a psychological study that was done uh, a while ago where uh, they had some people, and this is one of those psychological studies that they do sometimes where uh, they claim to be testing one thing, but they're really testing something else because it's important for the study that people not know what, what is being tested. So uh, they had some people use a, a piece of software on a, on a desktop PC. And then afterward, they asked those people to evaluate that piece of software, evaluate the experience of using that piece of software. Now, for one group of people, they had them use the software and perform the evaluation, fill out the survey, using the same PC for both tasks. Then they had another group of people who would use the software on one PC and then go over to a second PC to fill out the survey to give their feedback on the software. And what they found was that the people who used the same PC for both tasks were nicer. They were gentler in their feedback. It was almost as if they didn't want to hurt the computer's feelings. We see the same kind of thing in, the, in some of the anecdotes, the, pet, the press coverage, about the success of the iPod. Like the story of the 12-year-old girl who, the day she got her first iPod, before she went to bed, she kissed it goodnight. Now you can say, well, you know, that's a 12-year-old girl. But then there's the story of the, the adult, the grown-up, who their iPod broke, went out and bought a new one right away, but then couldn't take the new iPod out of the box for two days because it meant they would have to say goodbye to their old friend. They would have to say goodbye to that broken piece of metal and plastic. It's a powerful psychological connection that we have with these products. When they exhibit behaviors as if they were human, it's very difficult for us to let go of. This is an iPod case called iGuy that makes physical this relationship that we have with these products. Now, in the case of TiVo, the digital video recorder, it's a box that has to sit on a sh shelf with some other things. And so uh, they couldn't put arms and legs on it, so they put them on the logo instead. And as for the Wii, when, when Nintendo first announced the Wii, they used this little movie to introduce it with this animated logo of the letters, again, jumping around and moving around as if they were little people. By acknowledging this element of user psychology, by acknowledging the emotional and psychological connection that we have with interactive products, we can create products that are transformative because people respond better to products that know who they are, products that exhibit a consistent personality. In the development process, the trouble is that the way that we often think about it is like this. We start out with the data, and then around that data, we wrap a layer of logic to process and manipulate that data. And then around that, we have the outer shell of the user experience. In fact, shell is a term that technology people use to describe the user interface of an application. The trouble is that this model doesn't exist in the minds of our users. For the users, there's the user interface. The rest of it is magic. It's a mystery. All they know of the product is the interface that the product presents. 
But in our development processes, historically, we have started with the technology and built outward. But this is one of the biggest differences between the Web 2.0 companies and the previous generation of internet startups. These companies are starting with the user interface and working backward, making decisions about technology and features based on the experience they want the product to deliver. Tim O'Reilly is one of uh, probably one of the best known observers of this trend in the industry. He described it as designing from the outside in. In the development process, it can be a powerful differentiator. Here's another one of these products that was almost that, tra that transformative product. This is um, a product called the Tandy Zoomer. And this was actually the first commercial product to use, to use the Palm operating system. When Palm first started, they thought they were going to be a software company. They thought we, they could be Microsoft for mobile devices. So they sought hardware partners to work with them to bring these devices to market. But the hardware partners had their own ideas and had their own requirements. And they wanted these, these products to do all of these different things and piling all of these different features on. And uh, Palm had such a disastrous relationship with, t with Tandy, and the product itself was such a, feature, uh, a, a failure in the marketplace because of this feature overload, that they decided they had no choice. If they wanted to survive as a company, they had to get into the hardware business. And the way that they expressed it was that uh, in the PC world, it may be true that more features equal, equals a better user experience, but for handhelds, that is only true up to a certain point. And then beyond that point, adding features actually re reduces the user experience. And they felt that their approach as an organization was to stay in that sweet spot where you're maximizing the power of the experience and maximizing features. What's happened since this time, this was back in the mid-late 90s, what's happened since this time is that we've discovered this is true across every kind of technology product that more features don't necessarily equal better experience. But in order to deliver on this, you have to deliver from the point of view of experience strategy. Making choices about technology and features based on the experience that you want the product to deliver. When George Eastman, when he was bringing the, the Kodak camera to market, said, you press the button, we do the rest, he was describing the experience that he wanted his product to deliver. Not talking about the power unleashed by roll film. He's talking about the opportunity to create that transformative product. With this strategy in mind, he could go into the, per the design process, the process of developing his product, with this guiding star to help him make decisions about what would be part of his product and what would not be part of his product. What you leave out is almost more important than what you put in. It's all a question of staying aligned with your overall experience strategy. This is Google Calendar, and this uh, calendaring has been one of the kind of hot areas among the Web 2.0 companies for a while now. Google Calendar has, in a very short time, become one of the most popular applications. And Google is, is well known for being a very sort of engineering and technology-driven organization. But when they set out to create Google Calendar, they didn't start with a set of technologies that they wanted to implement. They started out with this bullet list, their vision for the product. Fast, visually appealing, joyous to use. The personality of the product, the experience that the product would deliver. Drop-dead simple, easy to share. With this, having arrived at this vision before they started investigating technology, before they decided, before they started deciding on features, they could make better choices every step of the way to make sure that they were, that they were staying true to that vision. And for Google Calendar, as with the Wii, it has really paid off. They have, in a very short time, overtaken the market leaders. Now, you might look at a list like that, that 
that list of the, uh, the vision for Google Calendar and, and say, well, that sounds like marketing speak, right? It sounds like the kind of thing that the marketing guys talk about our brand attributes, our brand values. This is not about brand. Because brand comes from the perspective of creating an identity for an organization and broadcasting that identity out to the users of the product. An experience-driven approach starts with an understanding of the user, starts with an understanding of user psychology and works backward to what the product needs to be in order to deliver the kind of experience that people want to have with the product. We saw this on a, on a project that we did not too long ago for a big financial services firm in the United States. They sent us all over the country to look at how people manage their finances and all the different tools that they use, the software and the printouts and all of those things. And out of that analysis, not just looking at how people use the website, which was the thing that we, they had asked us to design for them, but how they did all of their interactions with the organization. And out of this, we developed a set of what we called strategic design opportunities. Supportive, assistive, helpful, clear. With these strategic design opportunities in mind, we were able to look at the areas where the design of the product could deliver business value, put these things together, and by combining them, we were able to identify a concrete set of experience strategies for the product. Again, we haven't had the first technology discussion. We haven't even had the first design discussion. Just trying to figure out what should the personality of the product be? How should the product feel? And it's different from product category to product category, and it's different from brand to brand. But we were able to take these experience strategies into the design process, and they helped us make better choices every step of the way about the little details of the design. We were able to point to every aspect of the design of this website and explain how it connected back to the experience that we wanted the website to deliver. The trouble, as our client discovered, when the website was deployed was that the website couldn't solve the entire problem for the organization because the website was just one of several channels through which people interacted with this financial institution. So fixing the website kind of wasn't enough because the website wasn't the only thing that people were interacting with. In order to really address the overall user experience, we had to take an approach that was very different. I want to go back to the iPod for a second, because if you look at the iPod, it doesn't, whoa, OK. Let's skip this one. Pardon me. It doesn't really do very much. There are a few things, a few basic features that it provides. As I said, the Diamond Rio did a whole lot more. But this view only really applies if you look at the iPod as a standalone product. But the iPod isn't a standalone product. If you want to use the iPod, you've got to use iTunes, the desktop software that comes with it. And there's a whole bunch of other functionality that iTunes enables, taking the burden off of the iPod, allowing the design of the iPod to remain simple and focused on the user experience in the mobile context. The experience is extended even further by the iTunes store, allowing people to acquire media. So with the product allowing people to play, the desktop software to manage, and the store to allow pe allowing people to acquire media, all of the th these things pull together as an entire system, delivering an end-to-end -end experience. Because they were designed together that way. Now, not all of us have the opportunity to design for systems. In some cases, we may not have the level of control over all of the things that have to interact with our product. Now, photography has changed a lot since George Eastman's day. We now have digital cameras. And we have desktop software to manage photographs from digital cameras. And then we have camera phones 
We still want to get physical prints of our photographs sometimes, but often we want to share them on the web. Flickr is a Web 2.0 company that has been able to find a place for itself within this overall chaos of digital photography by designing as if it were part of this larger system. And again, Flickr, all of their choices are driven by their experience strategy. And Flickr's experience strategy is actually right out there on their website. This is what they say about their product. We want to help people make their photos available to the people who matter to them. To do this, we want to get photos into and out of the system in as many ways as we can. We want to enable new ways of organizing photos. Part of the solution is to make the process of organizing photos collaborative. Not a word here about technology. Not even describing the features of the product. But as the product has evolved, by staying true to this statement, this experience strategy, they're able to make strategic choices about technology, strategic choices about features that reinforce the experience that they want people to have with Flickr. And this little startup was acquired by Yahoo and is now one of the most popular photo sharing sites on the web. By placing themselves within this larger system, they're able to make these strategic choices so that they can provide uploading software for getting photos into Flickr easily off your hard drive or off of your camera phone. Web publishing tools to get photos out of the system. Their entire businesses now that are built on allowing you to get prints of your Flickr photos. And now that Flickr is a part of Yahoo, all of these points of integration between Flickr and other Yahoo applications. But again, it comes from knowing Flickr's place in the larger system by staying true to this experience strategy. All of this is about the, unleashing the power of new technology. The way that new technology can transform our lives. But in order to unleash that power, we have to see where the old ways and the new ways collide. We ha have to see what are the aspects of human behavior that never change. The aspects of human psychology that will always be there. So that no matter what happens with technology trends, we're able to create products that resonate with people, that integrate into their lives. Products that people can't live without. By looking to examples like Flickr and Kodak and the iPod and understanding that the experience is the product we deliver and the real source of value to our users. Thank you all very much for your attention.